Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel even better. Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. This is part two, even though the script says one, of a three-part series on wines from the Gonzales Valles portfolio. Like all the wines in this series, this is a free sample and I have free reign to review it however I wish. Now, Today's wine comes from Bronia. We are now in Spain for today's episode and our next one in the series, specifically in Rioja. Uh, let's get into some history and regulations for Rioja. So this is going to be a little long, but not like five hours long, okay? Um, there will be links to much of this below. So if you want to go further down the rabbit hole, please do it. Arguably, Rioja has one of the best wine-known regions in all of Spain. The classic red wine from here is based on Tempranillo, a widely planted grape and the most planted grape in all of Spain. It's, base, it's also the basis of most red Rioja wines. Its most common blending partners are Garnacha, the Spanish word for Grenache, uh, also Mezuelo uh, or Mezuelo, and then Graciano or, I'm sorry, Graciano or Graciano, uh, which is what this wine is made from. And just to clarify, Spain is the origin of Grenache or Garnacha. Also, you heard me say Mezuelo or Mezuelo and Graciano and Graciano. So as far as I know, the proper, true, proper Basque-ish pronunciation of those two is Mezuelo and Graciano, okay? Um, so you have like that, your tongue kind of does that, like almost like a lisp. Um, however, most of us say Mezuelo and Graciano, okay? Just so you know why I said both of them. Anyway, white and rosés are also made here in Rioja. Spain's most famous sparkling wine, Cava, can also be made in five different regions within Rioja. Cava can be made in all over Spain in designated areas, but its traditional home is in the Catalan area of Northeast Spain, which is not where we're at, okay? Anyway, Rioja has been making wine forever. It predates most areas of Europe with the Phoenician settlers in the 11th century BC making wine. However, it's really the Roman Empire that truly put Rioja on the map with many of the vineyards dating back to that era. Not the grapevines per se, but yes, there are vineyard plots that have been growing wine grapes for that long. Rioja has also uh, also has enjoyed an excellent reputation for hundreds of years, starting with pilgrims passing through uh, the area on their way to the shrine of St. James de Santiago de Compostela in a province called A Coruña in Galicia. Uh, another one where it's Galicia or Gal Galicia, okay? Um, anyway, what also brought significant change to Rioja, and, and a lot of people say Rioja, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm not pronouncing it purely like a Spaniard would, so just so if someone's like complaining that I'm flipping between different pronunciations, you know, I say Rioja, but Rioja, like they usually emphasize that, that the J is that H sound. Anyway, what brought significant change to Rioja was the phylloxera epidemic in the 1800s. This Laos hit France well before anywhere else. Uh, and in Spain specifically, Rioja uh, was a region French winemakers, mostly the Bordeaux people, the Bordelais, look to in order to stay in business. In other words, Phylloxera hit France first, and it hit Bordeaux, of course, and the Bordelais were like, where can we get some grapes? And so they went, they looked at Rioja, and um, they borrowed some grapes from there, or they maybe just made wine down there. I think I'm getting into that here. So from importing grapes and wines to French investment, the area prospered for a while, basically like I was saying. Even when Phylloxera hit in the 1890s, since uh, in, in uh, Rioja, since the cure was known by then of using American rootstocks to graft grapevines on. Uh, the use of French barrels also grew during this time. However, due to the rising cost of those barrels, American oak barrels became the new standard. They were significantly cheaper than French barrels. The judicious, the judicious use of American oak lent the wine characteristic flavors uh, and aromas of dill and coconut, and what we call whiskey lactones, as in 
American whiskey, uh, well, as American whiskey is also aged in American oak barrels. And with that said, there has been a rise in the use of French oak. So for those of us taking a wine certification exam, we can't always rely on those markers to identify red Rioja. And this has been this way for quite a while. It's not like, oh, in the last like couple years. This has been quite a while. I've had several MSs go, don't, don't sit there and think that you only will get dill or coconut or both um, from Rioja. It's, they, they use mixed barrels all the time. Okay, anyway, Rioja is also a place where you can find excellent quality across the board. There are young examples of Rioja well under $20, and some of the best Rioja can be still bought for $100. Uh, the Rioja DOCA occupies the majority of the autonomous region, or community as it's called, La Rioja. Spain is made up of 17 of these autonomous communities and two autonomous cities. The Rioja DOCA also has parts of Navarra and Basque country within it. This makes it what we call a supra auto autonomica, supra autonomica or super autonomous wine appellation because there because that there are more than one autonomous communities in inside the uh, appellation. Humia and Cava are the only other ones in Spain. Now the difference with like Humia is that it straddles it fully straddles two um, autonomous communities, whereas Cava is like little pockets throughout all of Spain in several of these communities. So it's not like you have like one large thing for Cava that spreads across. It's like little pockets of Cava or areas that have been designated to be able to make Cava. Otherwise, it's just Spanish sparkling wine. Anyway, Rioja is divided into three subregions. Rioja Alta, Rioja Oriental, and Rioja Alavesa. You may see Rioja Baja on a label. This is the old name for Rioja Oriental. This region is downriver along the Ebro River. Oriental is Spanish for east or eastern, and Baja is Spanish for lower or under. So my guess from how I understand that the producers of the area asked to rename it to something that had a better connotation. In other words, they didn't want to be lower or lesser, I guess, Rioja. This part of Rioja crosses over uh, into uh, Navarre in the north. Uh, so you'll also see this uh, community as Navarra. Rio Alavesa is in two sections and are wholly part of Basque country. These subregions don't seem to be standalone DOCAs as the file I downloaded from the Spanish government to make my map initially doesn't include them. However, it is documented in their laws, so I was able to create them on my own. In order to use a subregion, at least 85% of the grapes must come from that subregion. The 15% allowance only applies to grapes that are uh, from a neighboring zone with a 10-year history of working with, working with the vineyard. Since all three regions touch each other, you can source from vineyards, at, at, you can source from vineyards elsewhere uh, in Rioja. However, since there is a section of Rioja Alavesa that only touches Rioja Alta, I guess those wines can't use Oriental grapes, or at least not if you're going to use the labeling like I just described. All right, so what's a DOCA? Spain, like all EU countries, follows a standardized regional and quality classification system. Officially, they are PDO, or in English, Protected Designation of Origin, and PGI, in English, Protected Geographic Indication. But the EU allows each country to use their traditional terminology. In Spain, we have the following designations in order from lowest to highest. Uh, Vino de Mesa, or VDM, table wine. Indicación Geográfica Prote, uh, Protegida, which is IGP. Uh, Vino de Calidad con Indicación Geográfica, or VC. That is a quality wine with geographic indication. And then Denominación de Origen Prote, Protegida, that's DOP. And then Denominación de Origen, or DO. Then we have Denominación de Origen Calificada, which is DOCA. And then we have Vino de Pago, or VP, or Estate Wine. Now, there are only two DOCAs in Spain, Rioja and Priorat. These are considered the highest quality level designations in the country. Yes, the VP, or, or Pagos, they are estate wines and they are singular estates. They're kind of like monopoles. And the latest number I was told at a tasting I went to of some Pagos, 
uh, last week, yeah, as, I, as I'm recording this, said there are 39. The official website only has 33. I thought I read something that said 36. So I questioned this and they're like, well, you know, we're not always up to date on things. I'm like, okay, but you know, you're telling me it's 39, but I can't find a list of 39. Anyway, aging of wine in Spain is pretty standardized, unlike Italy. Italy is such a hot mess. Anyway, Rioja does have a couple slight differences, however. So you have generic or cosecta, uh, which doesn't have any aging requirement. Then you have crianza. So it must be two years of total aging. For red, there must be at least one year in barrels. And for white and rosé, at least six, month in, six months in barrels. For reserva, it's red. For red, it's a total of three years aging, at least one year in barrel, and then at least six months in the bottle. For white and rosé, it's two years total, uh, six months being in barrel. For sparkling, uh, two year on tirage or on the lees. And then you have Gran Reserva, red, five years total, at least two years in the barrel, and at least two years in the bottle. For white, it's five years total, and at least six months in the barrel. And then Gran Añada, uh, sparkling, is at least three years on tirage. So that's, so those are, must be vintage dated wines and must be hand harvested. Now that we have a bit of a foundation as to what Spanish wine and Rioja wine specifically is, let's talk about the winery. As far as history, there's not much. I'll just quote the single paragraph from the website. Quote, in 1973, a group of friends united by their love of gastronomy had a mission to create great wines to complement their culinary creations. The result was Bodegas Baronia. Our flagship winery is in La Rioja, Spain with a second winery solely dedicated to the production of Verdejo, located in Rueda. Almost five decades since we began, our award-winning pioneering wines are enjoyed amongst friends around the world." End quote. While they are light on history, the website does have a lot of information. First, they have, you know, like I said, a total of two wineries. The one in Rioja, where this one is from, and one in Rueda, where uh, they only make Verdejo. Now, Verdejo is the name of the grape, and it's a delicious white wine. They mentioned that the name Baronia is derived from the ancient Celts, known as Barones, that lived there at one time. The winery itself is located in the Alta subzone near the town of Olauri, which means potter, by the way. I looked that up. Um, this town is just southeast of one of the large of, of the larger town, Haro, or Otto. Um, and they are fairly close to the major river in Rioja, the Ebro River, the Ebro River. The climate is characterized by, well, there's, a, there's an influence from the Atlantic. So you have cold winters and mild summers and moderate rainfall. The soils here are composed of clay with limestone and iron, which will give those soils a reddish color. You also find alluvial soils here, given the proximity to the Ebro River. They have or purchase from over 900 hectares or 2,223 acres of vineyards. They reach as high as 700 meters or about 2,100 feet in elevation. The vineyards are comprised of five varieties, Tempranillo, Graciano, Mazuelo, Garnacha, and Viola. Vines are 20 to 100 years old and they are sustainably farmed, with some being cert certified organic. Even some of them are what we call own rooted. Uh, that means they're using native rootstock rather than American rootstock to combat phylloxera. And all vineyards are within 10 kilometers of the winery, which is an important part of not only a sustainable wine grower, but also a winery. It also, per their website, ensures an authentic expression of terroir. I'll agree with that assessment. The winery itself, at least what appears to be their new winery, is 100% sustainable. It was built in 2018. It has a plant-covered roof and is partially underground. That allows energy saving by using gravity-fed processes and temperature regulation. And uh, well, honestly, it looks kind of pretty, it looks pretty cool. Additional sustainability practices include the following. Using rainwater, using natural light, lower energy consumption, using geothermal energy, uh, reduce noise pollution, integrated waste management, minimal impact on the landscape. They are also the first winery in Europe to be LEED or L-E-E-D certified. In addition to that, they are also part of the Sustainable Wineries for Climate Protection Society. The website, their website still uses the older term without the word sustainable. Links below to both of these. There are a lot of links to check out, by the way. Let's talk Graciano or Graciano. 
It is a native grape to Spain that is primarily grown in Rioja. It's typically a very low yielding variety. Wines will have a deep red color, highly aromatic, and can age. It's got moderate tannins and can greatly influence a wine even in small doses, very much like Petit Verdot from Bordeaux. It's a difficult grape due to it producing very low yields, plus it is susceptible to mildew. Because of this, much of it was pulled in favor of Tempranillo, which is easier to manage and has higher yields. I think I got all the important bits, so let's get the stats for this wine. The 2020 Baronia Graciano suggested retail price $27.99. It is in the Rioja DOCA, 100% Graciano. It is WFCP certified. It's now the SWFCP, using the word sustainable. Uh, aging says Coseca. Uh, it's on the back label. Five months in new French oak barrels and six months in bottle. Bottled February 2022. ABV 13.5%. TA is 5.4 grams per liter, the pH is 3.5, the RS is 2.30 grams per liter, and the VA, or volatile acidity, is 0.62 grams per liter. <clears throat> Let's get into the wine. So, uh, as I mentioned in one of the Carmen Air episodes, uh, VA, so... Uh, volatile acidity, you know, is going to be in a wine, you know, at least a little bit. There are certain parts of the world where higher amounts are kind of acceptable. And, um, you know, they add character, as we would say. But um, in general, you, you want that number looks to be a good number, 0 0.62. Um, it's well below the maximums uh, allowed in the U.S. and the EU, from what I can tell. All right. Deep red color, right? Let's see. Now it's 2020, so we've had a little bit of age. I mean, it has a deep red color. I would call that that. And it's pretty consistent all the way to the edge. So I don't see it thinning out per se. I don't see it turning orange or browning. Heavier staining on the glass though, uh, than last week's Primus or Primus. Um, yeah, there's definitely more staining on the glass going on here. Okay. Red and black fruits, so raspberry, blackberry. Um, which You're going to say that for a lot of red wines, honestly. Or you're going to focus on maybe one color or the other. But raspberry, blackberry is usually an overriding thing that you're going to get. A little bit of plum, boysenberry. I can't be 100% certain, but marionberry came up in my head as I'm smelling this. I had some of that in an ice cream, in an ice cream about a month ago. It's very much like blueberry. There's... um. Some spice components in this. There's a little bit of actually um, pool toy, a little bit of rubber coming out, out of this. A little bit of oregano, basil, earthiness, cinnamon. Uh, not quite clove, but cinnamon, red hot. Forest floor, earth. I think I hit all the highlights on it. Let's just taste it. Spices. Delicious wine. Wow. I'm not going to say this is the first time that I've had Graciano on its own, but it probably is. Wow. Um, it's now going to be in that category of favorite grapes. So things like Gamay, Franconia, or Blaufrankisch, Saint Laurent, um, Graciano. Um, uh, 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 now I'm drawing a blank in Spain. Um, oh my goodness. I'm drawing, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank. So I'll, I'll, I'll remember it here in just a second. Uh, but it's another Spanish grape that I really love. And it has that same spice quality. There's nettle. There's, it's more red fruit. I get raspberry, cranberry, dried cranberry. Cinnamon still. Um, yeah. Florals, like kind of like pink and purple flowers. It's bugging me. I can't remember that Spanish, that Spanish grape. I'll put, if I don't remember between now and the end of the episode, by, you've already seen the lower third of it. I can't believe I can't remember this grape variety because it's one of my favorites from Spain. 
because it acts like this one too. It acts like Gamma. Minthea. Yes. Anyway, yes. It makes me think of fall. And it's juicy too. That's the thing, like there's fruit in there. It's not sweet fruit, it's ripe fruit. It's juicy fruit, not the gum. Um, but it's so wrapped into these spices, these Christmas spices. You know, you've got your frankincense and myrrh, you got your clove and all that kind of stuff. And just, um, just yes. This wine is to me, for my palate, for what I like in a wine, spectacular. It may not be for you. This style of wine may not be for you. But if you like Beaujolais, Cru Beaujolais, if you like Austrian reds, they're made of Blaufrankisch, right? If you like Saint Laurent, if you like Minthea, if you like that group of wines, you will like this wine, okay? If you don't like those group of wines, well, you can send it my way and I will drink it for you. This is, I, I like the wine a lot. 28 bucks, sure. Like single variety Graziano, not exactly uh, common. At least I don't think it is. Maybe in Spain it's more common, but I don't really ever see it around here. I'm just gonna drink the rest. It is really, really good. Yeah, it's gonna do it for this episode, man. Uh, so if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. And then tell your friends. We'll see you next time with one more Spanish wine from Gonzalez Baez.